Greetings. Greetings. This is Bradford Donald Keller Townsend. It's Saturday, the 29th of December, 2018. And uh, this video I'm calling A Machine Without Fuel is a Sculpture. And I'm going to start off uh, here at do the math using physics and estimation to assess energy growth options by Tom Murphy. Uh, just uh, a note here, the word energy uh, was invented in the year 1809. Uh, that was before uh, in economics, uh, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, uh, and the uh, physiocrats of France as well as um, many other uh, important thinkers in about every field. Uh, so without further ado, um, using physics and estimation to access energy growth options by Tom Murphy. Exponential economist meets finite physicist. Some while back, I found myself sitting next to an accomplished economics professor at a dinner event. Shortly after pleasantries, I said to him, economic growth cannot continue indefinitely, just to see where things would go. It was a lively and an informative conversation. I was somewhat alarmed by the disconnect between economic theory and physical constraints. Not for the first time, but here it was a close-up and personal. Though my memory is not keen enough to recount our conversation verbatim, I thought I would at least try to capture the key points and convey the essence of the tennis match with some entertainment value thrown in. Cast of characters, physicists, played by me, economist played by an established economics professor from a prestigious institution, scene, banquet dinner, played in four acts. Note, because I have a better retention of my own thoughts than those of my conversational companion, this recreation is lopsided to represent my own point words. So while it may look like a physicist-dominated conversation, this is more an artifact of my own recall capabilities. I also should say that the other people at our table were not paying attention to our conversation. So I didn't know what makes me think this was, would be interesting to readers if it wasn't even interesting enough to the other people at the table. <laughs> but here it goes. Act 1. Bread and Butter. Hi, I'm Tom, a physicist. Hi, Tom. I... <clears throat> am an economist. Hey, that's great. I've been thinking a bit about growth and want to run an idea by you. I claim that economic growth cannot continue indefinitely. Economist chokes on his bread. Did I hear you right? Did you say growth cannot continue forever? Physicist, that's right. I think physical limits assert themselves. Economist, well, sure, nothing truly lasts forever. The sun, for instance, will not burn forever. On the billions of years time scale, things do come to an end. Physicists, granted, but I'm talking about more immediate time scale here on Earth. Earth's physical resources, particularly energy, are limited and may prohibit continued growth within centuries or possibly much shorter, depending on choices we make. There are thermodynamic issues as well. Economists, I don't think energy will ever be limiting factor to economic growth. Sure, conventional fossil fuels are finite, but we can substitute non-conventional resources like tar sands, oil shale, shale gas, etc. By the time that runs out, we'll likely have built up a renewable infrastructure of wind, solar, and geothermal energy. Plus, next generation nuclear fission and potentially nuclear fusion, and there are likely energy technologies we can't not yet fathom in the farther future. Physicist, sure, 
those things could happen, and I hope they do, at some non-trivial scale, but let's look at the physical implications of energy scale expanding into the future. So, what's a typical rate of annual energy growth over the last few centuries, economists? I guess a few percent, less than 5%, but at least 2%, I should think. Okay, here's a chart. I'll blow it up a little bit if I can. No, <laughs> yep. oh, there it goes. United States total energy is on the x-axis at the top. I'll use my uh, mouse, my little Apple mouse, and put my little hand. That's called the x-axis there. And this is the y-axis here. And then the x-axis again. And, and on the x-axis at the bottom of the uh, square or rectangle, <laughs> I think it's probably a rectangle, uh, which means the sides are not equal. Uh, these two sides are equal and these are equal, but th th they're not the same. They could, it's hard to say. 1670, uh, 1700, 1750, 1800, so on and so forth. And then here's 2000, and if I take the little hand and go straight up, I hit here, and it hasn't been a perfect um, linear. See, there's increases there, and then it this dot is lower than that dot. See, it's several dots in a row uh, with decreased um, energy production rate. Well, or, and then you can see it's 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 a wavy line, and then um, this is usually called uh, a regression analysis or curve fitting. There's different terms for it, where you draw a red line, like you use a software program to load in all the data and it averages it out and then starting if you say going around here whatever year that is taking the hand down more or less about 1970s which is 1972 in particular is when per capita uh, global uh, joules which is a basic energy unit that is a newton uh, uh, force and then you have distance so like uh, you move uh, one kilo weight uh, up one meter uh, against the field of gravity. Um, that kind of gets the idea of what it's an exact definition of a joule, but, you, but it has um, a force, resisting a force and, and moving a distance. That's what it, the, and, and a joule um, is kind of a, if you think of a Russian doll, it's one of the smaller ones at the beginning. As you uh, or, or as you go down, uh, one of the more base uh, units of energy is the joule, uh, and then you get into more complicated ones, uh, and then ones for work. But so around 1972, um, per capita joules used per person um, began to level off. That's not in this, but I'm just. Okay, total U.S. energy consumption in all forms. This would include burning wood, which was when my pilgrim ancestors came from the Netherlands. Um, burning uh, wood was their major source of energy. And then they uh, did have some horses and uh, oxen, which are like a cow that can pull carts and things. That was their, they had what were called traction animals uh, in the uh, science lingo or uh, firewood, mostly, uh, to heat their homes. And then uh, they could make charcoal uh, for the smithies. Um, total U.S. energy consumption in all forms since 1650. Um, that's 30 years after we our whole generation after we got here. <laughs> the vertical scale is logarithmic uh, so that an exponential curve resulting from a constant growth rate appears as a straight line. The red line corresponds to the annual growth rate of 2.9%. So if you take wood, uh, water wheels, like the first uh, mills for flour, uh, the first... Uh, people who came over here from the Netherlands and England. Um, one of the first things they built was uh, windmills and water mills 
uh, to uh, mill their flour. Uh, they're quite, uh, if you had to go build one yourself or with five of your friends, um, it would be quite an accomplishment if you could build a working windmill that could uh, crush, you know, uh, your seeds and make you uh, wheat for your bread. <laughs> and the source for this is the EIA. And that's the uh, Energy Information Administration. And I think they're in the Department of Energy. But it's its own kind of standalone uh, institution. And they are very good uh, statisticians and scientists there. Um, physicist, right. If you plot the U.S. energy consumption in all forms from 1650 until now, you see a phenomenally faithful exponential at about 3% a year over the whole span. Wow, that's that, there's a rule called 72 and if you take um, 72 and divide it by your interest rate um, that's approximately what it takes for a doubling. So you're, you know, you're not uh, taking too long to double at uh, 3%. Let's see if you do it in your head you'd have uh, 3 times 20 will give you 60 and then 22 let's see that would be a 6 and then uh, a 6 again that would be 66 and then a 4 you, you get a 12 carry that up there that gets you up there uh, 24 so just doing my math in my head approximately every 24 years um, and when you think of things in geological longer term time like in uh, centuries and millennia um, doubling uh, that means if you use 10 uh, let's say barrels of oil just as a unit of energy and then uh, you get three doubles you double that again and that would give you 20 barrels then you double that again that give you 40 barrels but you're still not through the century yet okay so then you double that again at 24 years, what's um, so it was at 80 barrels now, and then you still have uh, more time left. So let's say you get a half a doubling left. Uh, well, 24 actually goes in four times. So as you see, if you only start off with 10 barrels, if you're doubling every 24 years, the amount of barrels of energy you're going to use would go from 10 to 24. I mean to 20, 20 to 40. 40 to 80 and then you still have one more so when you, you actually would have a wee bit left over wow so you got 160 plus barrels at 3% growth if you're growing your oil barrels so 100 years later um, and then you divide 3 into that so what do you need over 60 times the amount of energy in 100 years if you have 3% growth you need over 180 barrels um, to keep society going at what they're used to at that time, at the new time of growth. So, so how long do you think we might be able to continue the trend? Economists, well, let's see. A 3% growth means a doubling time is something like 23 years. I said 24. I'm <laughs> doing the math in my head. So each century might see something like a 15 to 20, every century will have a 15 to 20 time increase. I see you're, where you're going. A few more centuries like that would perhaps be absurd. But don't forget that population was increasing during centuries past. The periods in which you base your growth rate, population will stop growing before more centuries roll by. True enough, so we would largely agree that energy growth will not continue indefinitely. But two points before we continue. First, I'll just mention that energy growth has far outstripped population growth, so that per capita energy use has surged dramatically over time. Our energy lives today are far richer than those of our great-great-grandparents a century ago, economist nods, so even if population stabilizes, we are accustomed to per capita energy growth. Total energy 
would have to continue growing to maintain such a trend. Second, thermodynamic limits impose a cap to energy growth lest we cook ourselves. I'm not talking about global warming, CO2 buildup, etc. I'm talking about radiating the spent energy into space. I assume you're happy to continue our conversation to Earth, forgoing the specter of an exodus to space, colonizing planets living Star Trek style. Economists, more than happy to keep our discussion grounded to planet Earth. Physicists, sigh of relief. Not a space cadet. Whew. Good. All right, the Earth has only one mechanism for releasing heat to space, and that's via infrared radiation. We understand the phenomenon perfectly well and can predict the surface temperature of our planet as a function of how much energy the human race produces. A function is something like uh, for momentum. In physics, it's P stands for momentum. Then there's the equal sign, which means what's on the left side, the P equals the MV. And M is mass and V is velocity. And mass would be in things like kilograms, um, which means it's the same in outer space, for, far away from the Earth as it would be on Jupiter. And then, but on Jupiter, it would weigh, it'd be super heavy, and it would be pretty light for a human to hold on the moon. So it's not weight. It doesn't matter if there's any gravity on it. A kilogram has the same mass in deep space with almost no gravity or uh, on a big planet like uh, Jupiter. Um, so that's what they mean by a function. So they're saying that we know, if we know the inputs... Uh, mass and velocity uh, and put those in there then we can get the momentum or kinetic energy is one half mass velocity squared so if if we want to know how powerful a, a big swinging metal ball is um, like you know a, a big lead ball or a big bowling ball on a string or rope um, we know what the energy is by taking one half the mass times the velocity squared. So the, the, the speed is more important than the mass in creating kinetic energy, and kinetic means motion. So I'm just throwing in some basic science um, because uh, there's a lot of ignora ignoramuses out there who are ignorant. Um, that does not mean they're not highly intelligent or caring good people or righteous people, it just means you're ignorant of science. So I'm throwing in some basic science that may be reviewing it, or maybe you never had it, but real basic like science concepts. The planet as a function of how much energy the human race produces. The upshot is that at a 2.3% growth rate, conveniently chosen to represent a 10 times increase every century. The upshot is that a 2.3% growth rate conveniently chosen to represent a 10 times growth rate every century. We would reach boiling temperature in about 400 years. So when you uh, turn on your uh, engine and start burning gasoline in your sport utility vehicle, um, 70 more percent of that energy goes out just into heat into the atmosphere, you know, around you. And, and 30 percent goes to maybe pushing the pistons up and down. And then only a fraction of that energy goes to turning the crankshaft and the transmission and such that actually gets the wheels to twist and turn. Uh, we call that uh, angular momentum for them to rotate. And uh, then there's uh, friction between your vehicle and the road, but if there's rain or ice or it's a hot day or a cold day, it makes a difference on what your friction is. And so since you don't have perfect friction, uh, some of the sp from time to time, the tire uh, rotates without with slides and, and it's not rolling and uh, it's rotating but not pushing you forward or braking, you know, with the um, the way the brakes work, they rotate your tires real quickly in short little jerks um, to keep putting new tread onto the road. Um, 
And this statement is independent of technology. Even if we don't have a name for energy source yet, as long as it obeys thermodynamics, we cook ourselves with perpetual energy increase. So we know f the laws of thermodynamics are the best laws we have, and at all scales, microscopic or macroscopic, uh, at human size, uh, sun size, or at atom size, thermodynamics has been um, proven. There's never been an exception found. And anytime you like burn fuel, you're making, you're creating entropy, and a large part of your heat um, is lost into the, uh, you know, the environment around you uh, and the atmosphere and then the ground and or into metal, you know, touching a building, that kind of thing. Economists, that's a striking result. Could not technology pipe or beam the heat elsewhere rather than relying on thermal radiation? Physicists, well, we would and do somewhat beam non-thermal radiation into space like lasers, radio waves, etc. But the problem is that these sources are forms of high-grade, low-entropy energy. Low-entropy means um, that it's highly organized. A diamond um, would be low entropy. It's in a, a lattice shape, uh, an ice cube, uh, you know, in your freezer would be low entropy because uh, there's, um, it, it's organized in a crystalline shape or um, salt that you uh, use as a condiment is low entropy because it's, you know, it's in crystal form. Instead, we're talking about getting rid of the waste heat from all the processes by which we use energy. This energy is thermal in nature. Thermal is heat. And heat is vibrating or jiggling. Um, and we might be able to scoop up some of this to do some useful work, but at very low thermodynamic efficiency. If you want to use high-grade energy in the first place, having high entropy waste heat is pretty inescapable. So you, you, may, you go from something being organized, let's say in octane, I think oct is eight, so you would have eight carbon atoms, and it's um, a hydrocarbon, which means it has hydrogens in it, so you have eight uh, carbons, and then you, you have... I don't know how many uh, hydrogens, uh, let's say 18 in octane. I'm just throwing out a number, probably wrong. But, but so that's what you have. And when those bonds are broken, um, you have a exothermic reaction that gives off heat. And uh, when you burn the fuel, the expansion of the gases in the cylinder pushes your pistons up and down. And through a very complex uh, system you, with the transmission in there, and crankshaft and all that, it translates into rotating tires and uh, turning uh, a dynamo that uh, powers your stereo and your headlights and your heat or air conditioner. Okay, but I still think our path can easily accommodate at least a steady energy profile. We'll use it more efficiently and for new pursuits that continue to support growth. Before we tackle that, we are too close to an understanding point for me to leave it unspoken. At the 2.3% growth rate, we would be using energy at a rate corresponding to the total solar input striking Earth in a little over 400 years. We would consume something comparable to the entire sun in 1,400 years from now. By 2,500 years, we would use energy at the rate of the entire Milky Way galaxy, 100 billion plus stars. I think you can see the absurdity of continued energy growth. 2,500 years is not that long from a historical standpoint. Uh, I'm Jewish, and even if you take a secular view of the Torah, uh, the five books of Moses, they were at least as old as Ezra the prophet 
uh, which is over 2,500 years ago. I mean, they, they're pretty sure that whoever, if it was written, you can say it was written by humans, um, they were probably Jewish scribes from Babylon uh, Empire, you know, which is now more than 2,500 years ago. Um, we know, so it's not that long, I mean, it's a long time, but, you know, we have historical records going back farther than that, or at least documents. I think I know what we're not going to be doing 2,500 years hence, economists. That's really remarkable. I appreciate the detour. You said about 1,400 years to reach parity with solar output. Right. And you can see that the thermodynamic point in this scenario as well. If we try to generate energy at a rate consummate with that of the sun in 1,400 years and did this on Earth, physics demands that the surface of the Earth must be hotter and much harder than the surface of the sun. Just like, That's a law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to ex explain it all. Um, but um, if you're interested... Um, just Google thermodynamics, go to physics.org and um, Britannica. Um, and uh, usually when it comes to just natural science and math, uh, Wikipedia and um, there's wiki textbooks even on uh, that are free on thermodynamics, I think, if you put in wiki textbook. And uh, you can, or buy, I own a book called Thermodynamics for Dummies. And those dummies books are a real good uh, way, place to start. Um, don't let the dummy name, um, that's just kind of a, a shtick that they use to uh, <laughs> sell. Uh, just like 100 watt from the light bulb results in much hotter surface than the same 100 watt you and I generate via metabolism spread out across a much larger surface area. We do have a basal metabolism and need at least 1,500,000 ca calories. So a thousand uh, times a thousand is a million, I think, and uh, so we need over one million five hundred thousand calories just to keep our hearts beating and breathing. And um, we have something called respiration. That's why we have to pee because uh, that uh, chemical reaction creates a uh, uh, two hydrogen O, uh, and uh, we call that water. Act two, salad. Economist. So, as I am convinced as I need to be that growth in raw energy use is a limited proposition, that we must one day at the very least stabilize to a roughly constant yearly expenditure. At least I'm willing to accept that as a standard point for discussing the long-term prospects of economic growth. But coming back to your first statement, I don't see that this threatens the infinite continuance of economic growth. For one thing, we can keep energy use fixed and still do more with it in each passing year via efficiency improvements. Innovations bring new ideas to the market, spurring investment, like spurring a horse. My family for generations had a horse farm in Indiana. And I have uh, in-laws that have one. And uh, that's how I, I rode horses at a very young age. And that's how you make your horse go. You spur it. <laughs> you uh, In its haunches, that's what the lingo is. You tap it with your heels, and that makes the horse go. Um, market demand, etc. These are things that will not run dry. We have plenty of of examples of fundamentally important resources in decline, only to be substituted and rendered obsolete by innovations in another direction. Yes, all these things happen and will continue at some level, but I am not convinced they will represent limitless resources. Do you think ingenuity has a limit? That the human mind itself is only capable, only so, so capable? That could be true but we can't credibly predict how close we might be to such a limit. Physicist. That's not really what I have in mind. Let's take efficiency first. It is true that over time, cars get better mileage. Refrigerators use less energy. 
buildings are built more smartly to conserve energy, etc. These examples tend to see factor of two improvements on a 35-year time frame, translating to 2% a year. But many things are already as efficient as can be expected them to be. Electric motors are a good example. At 90% efficiency, it, it will always take 4184 4, joules to heat one liter of water one degree Celsius. In the middle range, we have giant consumers of energy like power plants improving much more slowly at 1% a year or less. And these middling things tend to be something like 30% efficient. How many more doublings are possible if many of our devices were zero point, uh, 0.01% efficient? I was thinking of saying it English style, 0 not 0, 0.01% efficient. Had to translate back into American English. I would be more enthusiastic about centuries of efficiency-based growth ahead of us. But we may only have one more doubling in us, taking us less than a century to realize. So what they're saying is things are, can only get so efficient, and then once you meet the physics um, constraint reality, then they're as efficient as they can get. Like an electric motor is about as efficient as it can get. There's not much improvements um, possible. Okay. Point taken, but there is more to efficiency than incremental improvement. There are game changers. Teleconferencing instead of air travel. Laptop replaces desktop. iPhone replaces laptop, etc. Each for more energy frugal than the last. Each far more energy frugal than the last. Each one using less energy. The internet is an example of an enabling innovation that changes the way we use energy. Well, what their physicists may not say next is that it's usually all the above. People who have laptops usually have iPhones and usually have desktops. And their children may have video game consoles. And they, as TVs get better, they may keep their uh, TV and put it into the kitchen uh, so they can uh, listen uh, to a program or watch a program uh, why they cook um, so and the same with energy when we went from coal um, to uh, crude oil then from crude oil to uranium for nuclear we did, we kept using uh, we still use wood uh, to cook food and to heat our homes in the, because you know the bottom three billion of people don't have access to much electricity or water if any at all and they're still using, you know, twigs and uh, cow dung and things uh, to to heat and, and cook with. So it's usually when we find a new source of energy, we just add, or material, um, we just or invent or, uh, a new product. It doesn't necessarily replace another product. It's just an additional product. These are important examples, and I do not expect some continuation along this line. But we still need to eat, and no activity can get away from energy use entirely. Semi-reluctant nod bobble. Sure. That means he's moving his head. <laughs> um, Indian uh, Bollywood films, they do that bobble. <laughs> sure. There are lower intensity activities, but nothing of economic value is completely free of energy. Economist. Some things can get awfully close. Consider virtualization. Imagine that in the future we could all own virtual mansions and have our very need satisfied all by stimulative neural trickery. We would still need nutrition, but the energy required to experience a high energy lifestyle would be relatively minor. And this is an example of enabling technology that obviates the need to engage in energy intensive activities. Want to spend the weekend in Paris, you can do it without getting out of your chair. 
move like an IV drip equipment toilet than a chair, the physicist thinks. <laughs> Sitting on a toilet with an, I, an, an IV and a virtual reality headset, and then you've got some plugs in your nose that miss the smell of Paris. Um, let's say you're in a working class neighborhood and you can, the smells of people cooking and smoking marijuana or whatever, and you walk in tobacco and you walk by and trash and you can smell it with a little mist into your nose and then you don't have to get up to pee, you just pee in the toilet and then um, the virtual reality is, you know, showing you the images and then you could even have uh, fans to change the temperature and uh, blowing on your skin. And I guess you could be naked sitting there. Uh, with leads connecting to you, monitoring your heart rate and such, and respiration, uh, and uh, scanning your brain. Uh, physicists, I see, but this is still a finite expenditure of energy per person. Not only does it take energy to feed the person today at a rate of 10,000 calories of energy input per thousand calories eaten no less but the virtual environment probably also requires a supercomputer by today's standards for every virtual voyage you're the supercomputer at UCSD I almost went there that's University of California San Diego I went to Indiana University instead consumes something like 5m is for mega million watt that's a, a unit of work um, something has to be moved. Uh, there's no motion. They have to have motion to have work, um, like uh, pushing a handcart um, is, or pulling a handcart or pushing it is doing work because uh, you're it's moving. If you're just pushing on the cart hard, but it it's too heavy for you to move, it's too loaded up. You're not doing any work uh, from you know the physics definition. Granted. We can expect improvement on this end, but today's supercompute and there's time involved in the uh, it's how fast you can push the cart like per second or per minute. Granted, we or hour we can expect, but but the the fundamental unit is second. <laughs> we can expect improvement on this end, but today's supercomputer eats fifty thousand times as much as a person does. So what they're saying is how much you eat every day, the, uh, the calories intake by, say, the average American times 50,000 is how much a supercomputer uses. Um, so there's a big gulf to cross. I'll take some convincing. Plus, not everyone will want to live this virtual existence. Economists, really. Who could refuse it? All your needs met and an extravagant lifestyle? What's not to like? I hope I can live like that myself someday. So you're shriveled up in a pod, peeing and pooping uh, through catheters or something with drugs being pumped into your body and uh, nutrients. Um, why even have you around? I mean, what's the? <laughs> uh, who are the people that keep all the keep it all? Would keep, would be willing to work to keep the other people in virtual reality that have to maintain the computers and. Uh, clean out your IVs and change them out and things. Physicist, not me. I suspect many would prefer the smell of real flowers, complete with aphids and s sneezing, the feel of real wind messing up their hair, even uh, real rain, real bee stings, and all the rest. You might be able to stimulate all these things, or simulate all these things, but not everyone will want to live an artificial life. And as long as there are any holdouts, the plan of squeezing energy requirements to some arbitrary low level fails, not to mention meeting fixed bioenergy needs. Act 3, the main course. But let's leave the matrix and cut to the chase. Let's imagine a world of steady population and steady energy use. I think we've both agreed on these physically imposed parameters. A parameter is usually an input into a big equation a big formula, um, like uh, temperature, uh, uh, time, uh, distance, and uh, 
like distance might be remember, d, and for all the little d's, you put the, the distance into that big formula. You, you might put uh, meters in there. If the flow of energy is fixed, but we posit continued economic growth, then GDP continues to grow while energy remains at a fixed scale. This means that energy, a physically constrained resource, mind must become arbitrarily cheap as GDP continues to grow and leave energy in the dust. Yes, I think energy plays a diminishing role in the economy and becomes too cheap to worry about. Wow, do you really believe that? A physically limited resources, read scarcity. This is uh, fundamental to every economic activity becomes arbitrarily cheap. Turns attention to food on the plate somewhat stunned. I have a book called Scarcity, and it's by Clungston, and it goes through all the natural resources. Um, and it's called Humanity's Final Chapter. And uh, he talks about when uh, estimates are uh, for our resources to be depleted. And if you just kind of do a really um, over-reductionist simplification, by the year 2070, more than four out of five of our natural resources like copper, lithium, uh, coal, and so forth, you know, and some of them like aluminum aren't supposed to run out, but four out of five are by the year 2070. So my niece, you know, who's three, and women in our family usually live to be like 90 years old, <laughs> um, if you go, let's say, 80 years into the future, um, she'll uh, likely live past the year uh, 2100. And, and by then, a whole generation would have been born and become mature adults um, since four out of five of our uh, inputs to mechanical civilization have been completely exhausted. Uh, coal, uh, crude oil, um, and natural gas should all be uh, exhausted by 2070 with only a small remnant used by like the military or warlords or whatever's around at that time. Okay, so let's be clear that we're talking about the same thing. Energy today is roughly 10% of GDP. Let's say we cap the physical amount available each year at some level but allow GDP to keep growing. We need to ignore inflation as a nuisance in this case. If my 10 units of energy this year cost $10,000 out of my $100,000 a year income, the next year that same amount of energy costs $11,000 and I make $110,000. I want to ignore such an effect as meaningless inflation and the GDP growth. Agreed. Um, there's more here. I'm going to stop uh, now. I think I've uh, made my point. Um, thank you very much. Uh, au revoir.